Hey everyone, welcome back to the lab. In this video, we're going to be talking about why you should use Pydantic data classes instead of Python data classes. So I've used Python for the last five-ish years of my career, and I regularly lament about how bad Python's type system is. Luckily, there are some tools like Pydantic to make it suck a little less. And I tell you how long I've been using Python um, at jobs because I regularly get feedback that my uh, gripes with Python is a skill issue. And that's probably true. I'm really not the best Python person or anything like that. But at some point you have to think about if 80 or 90% of the people using a technology are running into the same errors, like yes, it is a skill issue, but maybe it's also a design issue. You know, if like one person fails, maybe it's on them. But like if everyone's failing, maybe it's just a bad design. And so in this post, I'm going to share an example of why you should probably use Pydantic data classes over Python's built in data classes. So what's the point of types and programming? So types are basically a way to label a code flow. This is useful because it means at any point along that flow, you can easily tell what kind of data is flowing through it. And I kind of like to think of this as using colored wires or adding labels to your wires, because really that's what we're doing, right? We're just like wiring or piping data around. And so if we don't have colored wires, it's hard at any one point to necessarily know what's in there without inspecting it or looking at the source. But if you have colored wires or at least like labeled wires, you can pretty easily say like, oh, this is carrying water or electricity or fire. Um, and so we don't have to like do the extra footwork to, to figure out what's in there. And I think for small scale programs, this doesn't matter so much. You can probably just remember or figure it out what's in a code flow. I think this is like wiring a personal desk or maybe like, you know, your entertainment system. Like, yeah, there's a lot of wires and they're all like jumbled up back there, but it's like probably okay, you know? You can figure it out. There's only like a dozen wires, it's fine. But the problem is like for larger scale programs with dozens of engineers, this really becomes a heavy tax on productivity because we're not dealing with like dozens of wires anymore. Now we're dealing with like a whole data center's worth of wires. So this is like hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of wires all jumbled together. And so if we don't have this idea of like labels or colors on the wires, it's extremely hard to figure out what wire is doing what. And so that's the short version for a much longer version of this metaphor. Um, you can check out types for snow types, how types allow code to scale across developers, organizations, and lines of code. Now let's talk about what Python types and data classes. And so, you know, Python used to be fully dynamic. It didn't have any types, but like slowly people started to realize that like developing without types is ridiculous at scale. And so Python caught on and they added types and this is good. You know, this is better than it was. Some types are better than no types as evidenced by every single company I've worked at that uses Python, including Instagram eventually moving away from dynamic Python and towards typed Python. This is often like a multi-year uh, migration for these like millions of lines of code code bases, but this has been worth it basically in every organization I've been in. Now, a data class in Python is similar to a record in other programming languages. Basically what it allows you to do is create a logical grouping of properties. This is useful because often a single variable or type is not enough to describe something. Often we need several fields. And in object-oriented land, this is often like what a class is used for, although a class is not the same as a record. We probably wanna focus on records so we get lean uh, data models. Um, but this is like a very common thing required, you know, in, in programs. And so in Python, you can use it kind of like this. So you just say from data classes, import data class. This is in the standard library. And then you just um, create a class as you would normally. And then you add this data class decorator. I'm using a few um, parameters here. And then you can just add in um, properties as you would a normal class and their types. Obviously, this is a bad example because it only has one property. So it'd probably just use, you know, a uh, variable for this. But this is what we're going with. Now this creates a data class with one property number with type int. It uses frozen here to make this type immutable. So if you tried to say like regular data class dot number equals something else after you've already created it, it's going to throw a runtime exception. Note this is not a static, you know, compile time exception. So you would hit it at runtime, but at least there's an exception there. And um, keyword only equals to true, which basically means you can only use keyword args. This is useful if you have something with like seven properties and they're all ints, it's very easy to like switch up the order of them on accident. 
um, or for this to change the order of these, not knowing that they're load bearing. Um, and so that helps prevent that issue because you have to set it to the property itself. For more on like Python data classes, why I think they're useful and how I recommend using them, you can check out um, this post linked here. Okay, so now we understand types, we understand how Python does types and data classes, and now we need to talk about the problem with Python's types and data classes. Now the problem with these types and the data classes that are built on is that these types are not really enforced in the language. There are a lot of linters out there that help you find errors, but there's very little that protects you at runtime. At the end of the day, Python is still a dynamic language. Even though it's out of types, it's still a dynamic language at its core. And so it lets you trip yourself up in the same ways a dynamic language would. And so to give you an example of this, let's take our simple data class above. And we would assume that because the number property is a type int, that we could only set it to an int, right? It's wrong actually. And this is because of Python and because it's dynamic. So here's a very simple example, right? We, we create our data class as normal. Um, we create it here. We create it with a keyword arc, and then we try to print this. And so if this these types were enforced, this would not be allowed because you, there is no none int. Um, but actually what happens when you run it is it runs fine. Regular data class here with number equals to none. And I'm just a random guy on the internet, so I'm gonna show this to you by actually running it um, to prove that this is the case. All right, so here I am in my Hamilabs Labs code examples repo. There'll be a link to this at the bottom of the post. Um, and here I've just got a very simple uh, Python program set up so that I can run these examples that are in the post. Um, basically it's just a main.py and then I'm running it with Docker because I like Docker. Um, you can learn about that in one of my, my other videos. But basically here we've got the Python example. So here's that data class that we have, we're just saying hello world. And then um, we're creating the regular data class and printing it out. And so I'm just gonna run this real fast and we can see the output. Um, we get hello world and then we get regular data class here, which tells us that even though we're setting none to an int field, it's actually just creating successfully, no problem. It just takes it. And so the regular data class is created successfully, even though the values inside of it do not align with its types. And now this is bad because all other code will be written based on this type, right? Like if we're using this regular data class in code and you're expecting this field, you're gonna just say like, oh, that's an int. We know that it's in the type system, it must be true. Um, but it's not going to be, it's gonna be none instead. And you know, this is how we get null pointer exceptions in so many of our languages, because the types just aren't very good. So how do we fix this Python types and data class issues? So how do we fix this? Well, unfortunately, Python is a dynamic language through and through. And so fixing this at the language level is hard. Yes, they have types, but they often don't really do anything. So they're not super useful. Basically all the types in Python these days like are just, linters, right? It's the same as like TypeScript to JavaScript. It's just a linter on there. So it's gonna to try to catch things at compile time, but at the end of the day, there's differences. It's not gonna catch everything. And the Python still has a bunch of holes in it that, you know, the types just aren't very. And so a new layer of utils has been created over the years like Pydantic to work as a more type safe validation layer. Now it doesn't add more types to the, like the linting stage. We have linters for that, but you know, they still miss stuff, um, but it does add more runtime validations. And so these are things kind of like Zod for JavaScript, maybe Fluent Validator or something like that for C Sharp. And so here's an example of how this actually protects our data class better than Python's built-ins. And so we have the example that I just showed you. And then we have a Pydantic example at the bottom, which I will run. So I'm back over in my example project, and then I'm gonna uncomment this code so we can actually run it and see the outputs. So we'll run it and see what happens. Okay, so at the top, we see our hello world in our regular data class. So we know that this is created successfully. And then we basically try to do the same thing, right? We have our data classes, looks exactly the same. We're just using Pydantic's data class instead. And then we create it with none. And we can see that we get this big old error. And basically it's saying like, hey, I have a validation error. And the reason is that the input should be a valid integer. It thinks it's of type int, but the input value we get is none and that types is none type and therefore it isn't allowed. And so this throws as we would expect like a normal type safe, you know, language or system to throw. Like number cannot be none, it must be an int. And so you shouldn't ever create it. And we can see that this works correctly because we see this error message and we never see our Pydantic data class um, output here. And so we don't catch this at dev time. As I said, this isn't like helping the linter or anything, but at least we can catch this at runtime where it's created. And this is much better than something failing somewhere and having to trace it back to the origin of the type lie. For example, a lot of the times when you're creating these, 
you know, data classes, this might be to represent a DTO from, from user input or something like that. But that DTO might travel quite far into your system before that given property is ever actually used. And so if your system is built with these type lies on them, it's very easy for something to fail way, way, way over here. And, but the actual source problem is way over here at the edge. And so this doesn't prevent these necessarily from happening. You know, we're still gonna have a lot of these issues at the translation layer, but at least it will fail right when the type misaligns, as opposed to us having to like find it hundreds, thousands of, of lines later um, and try and trace it back to its source. And this has literally happened to me um, this half and it's really annoying. And so, you know, this would have saved me a good 45 minutes of work if, if we could have just caught this when actually the bad data uh, came in. Next. So I like types. They make my dev experience better. Unfortunately, sometimes you don't get to pick your technology, so you have to deal with what you have. Pydantic helps make working with Python a little more sane, so I like Pydantic. If you want to run this project yourself, you know the demo that I was showing you before, you can get this example's for source code here and access to dozens of other example projects by joining Heminians. That's basically my full repo here. We've got this example, a few Python examples, and then I've got dozens of other F Sharp and Svelte examples. So you can find that here and you can learn more by looking at the Heminians page. Now, if you like this post, you might also like Python data class best practices and why I should use them. For more on types, you might be interested in types versus no types, how types allow code to scale across developers, organizations, and lines of code. And you might also be interested in five reasons F Sharp is a great Python alternative for scripting, side projects, and enterprise applications. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.